Welcome, Evan. Thank you so much for take two of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, minus the technical difficulties this time, I hope. <laughs> thanks oh, for thanks for that. having us. I got Henry here, too. Oh, I have uh, I have Naya here on the floor. Here I can. Oh, pick, right on. Can pick it up. She likes to lay right there. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So it's like a four four person podcast. Four. Uh, there we go. <laughs> um, okay, so your book, World Wild Vet, which yes, it's hard to say. World Wild Vet. There we go. Yes. <laughs> um, Encounters in the Animal Kingdom. Tell me a little more about this book. I know that you wrote it over 15 years and obviously I've read it, but tell listeners what what inspired you to sort of do a travelogue of all the places you've been to and all the experiences you've had with animals. Why now in your career did you decide to write a book? I am so fortunate that I've been to so many places and I've worked with so many different species and different habitats and seen what, what it is to work with wildlife, appreciate them in their natural environment, uh, be involved in their conservation efforts and veterinary medicine for individual animals. And I feel I've got a lot of different messages to share from around the world. And, and they can vary quite significantly, whether you're in Australia or Africa or Central America. And so I thought, you know, I, I did think about you know, writing a book for years, um, but I didn't think it'd be till later in my career. But I decided to do it now because I think I have enough experiences to to share, and uh, and, uh, and you know I've got a lot of messages to share as well. And I felt like now actually is a good time to start to start writing and sharing those those uh, experiences and messages and lessons, and just you know try to my my whole goal is to get people excited about animals, teach them a little bit about that medicine and what you know what that's about, and then of course uh, a big part of that is you know make, making an effort towards wildlife conservation awareness and sharing that whole world. And I've gotten to see that in so many different places. Amazing. And you've had some really unbelievable <laughs> experiences, but actually the part that stuck with me the most was after you went on this whole big adventure and collected this amazing footage and everything, your, was it your car that was broken into and you lost everything and, and you had oh, lost like gosh. 34 pounds. And yeah. tell me, tell oh. me that story again. Oh man. Yeah, I, I don't often rent cars when I travel. So many places I go, you just don't need to. But it made sense for the things I wanted to do in Costa Rica. And anyways, I just got into this hotel. Um, and I think I was arranging the room, like just getting kind of settled in there and away from the car for not very long. And it was like dusk. And by the time I came back to the car, it was night. And man, I opened the door and everything's gone. Everything. And so I had a few things. With, I had a day pack with me that had my passport, which was huge. It had uh, a memory card that had a few pictures, um, but you know, 99% of it was gone. All my travel stuff, obviously, I bring you know my snake hook and my croc snare, and I had my clothes, and everything was in that bag, and that was all gone. Um, oh man, yeah, no, I was so pissed. <laughs> I was not fun to be around for a few days. I, I it was crazy. I'm not a, an angry person, but oh my gosh, I wanted somebody to disrespect me in some way so I could take out my. Uh, the anger on them or something. It was it was a horrible mental state to be in and things worked out. You know, I still have those memories. Nobody can take those away from me, but I, I sure wish I had the footage and the pictures to back it up, you know? So sorry. That was all of your Galapagos experiences too, right? Yeah, that exactly. Uh, exactly. So sorry. And then of course you go to Costa Rica. I think it was when you were in Costa Rica when you sort of kidnapped a crocodile and uh, <laughs> left her, yeah. left Lift left your girlfriend sleeping in Costa Rica in some hotel, and you know she thought God knows what happened to you, and you came back with the crocodile, which I can't yeah. say has ever happened to me in any of my travels with anyone. I've never heard of anybody <laughs> doing such a thing. I, mean, I wouldn't do it again today. It was just, it's just legally, I don't know that what that entail would entail. It's probably not, probably not allowed. Um, but it was, my, it was my first crocodile that I'd ever caught in the wild. You know, I worked with alligators and some other crocodile species in captivity, but to see one in the wild and it was so easy and I just was dying to make an educational video about it and get some pictures with it and everything. And, and I, at that time I was just making educational videos for YouTube. And, uh, you know, I have one picture from that experience that I had emailed to, uh, to somebody and, um, I at least have that from that experience, but yeah, it was so funny. I guess I didn't realize how long I was gone because she was freaked out when I came back. I mean, she really was about to call the embassy. She thought I was kidnapped and she can worry sometimes and that can escalate rather quickly. <laughs> but um, no, she went from being freaked out to being willing to help me film this guy within a matter of minutes. And she got in the car and 
we went over to exactly where I caught him, got some amazing footage for a few minutes and let him go. And that was that. Oh my gosh. And then you were bit, bitten by a snake and your mom had to get involved and it was like a whole thing. I mean, yeah, well, I've been bitten by hundreds of snakes and maybe thousands by this day, but that was a venomous snake. Yeah. So that was, that was, again, it was the kind of thing where, you know, you just, you learn lessons along the way. And I've definitely done many things and I wouldn't do today. And that was one, that was probably the biggest one that was also a blessing in disguise because it did obviously give me an opportunity to gain an even bigger respect for dangerous animals. And I'm lucky I got bit by not the most venomous snake. It was a copperhead, which is bad news. That can be pretty destructive and, and pretty scary. I didn't have any permanent damage that I know of and everything worked out. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, if, if I'm working with an animal where I think the danger risk is too high, then I just say, you know, I got to pass on this one, you know, or we have to do this a different way or I have to sedate it or, you know, we have to just approach it a little bit differently. Um, but I still work with a lot of venomous snakes and, and so love it. So how did you go from doing educational videos on YouTube to having like a million followers and a TV show on the animal planet? Like, how did that happen? I mean, that was all part of the vision that all started when I, you know, in that, in that first chapter when I'm road tripping in Australia and I had my mom set up my camera, my tripod. I wanted to just start making that kind of content, having no idea where it would go. Um, I would say, I mean, I did a couple TV guest appearances shortly after graduating vet school. And I think they found me on YouTube or something. I'm not totally sure. And it was, um, it was the Chris Jenner show it was my first show and it was a total blast. And then I did another couple shows. And then in 2014, towards the end of 2014, about a year and a half after I graduated vet school, uh, People Magazine, I don't know how they found me, but they offered to include me in their Sexiest Man Alive uh, issue they put out at the end of the year every year, right? And so I was the sexiest veterinarian. That year I was the sexiest beast charmer. The, the other years they did it, I was the sexiest veterinarian at least. But it was like, the first time it was like a men at work section. So it was different professionals and they're the sexiest chef or teacher or whatever. Um, and then in early 2016, and I think it was unrelated to the people thing, um, I had some big publications put out articles about me. So like one called Board Panda did. And then when they did Huffington Post and, um, uh, oh, what's that other big one? Buzzfeed and a few other big ones like reached out for an interview. And then they did like a story on me basically. And then I just, it, it, you know, the, the, in those days it was, I think easier and, you know, more possible to just go viral. And I went from hitting 10,000 followers the night before that I was so excited about and then two weeks later, I was at like 220,000 and then kind of grew from there. Wow. And how has that affected you? Like, how has that affected your personal life and your relationships? Like, do you feel like you have people like glomming onto you who you don't trust now? Or do you like stick to yeah. your core people from growing up? Or like, how do you handle that? I mean, personal wise, nothing's changed. I mean, my friends, they think it's funny when they, you know, they, I'm the sexiest vet or whatever. They know that's not like that's not what I was striving for necessarily, even though it's been a blessing. I'm not like complaining about it. And same with going viral. There's been way more positive things than negative things. And for me, I mean, I'm, a, I, you know, I'm a pretty down to earth kind of guy. Like it's not changed a whole lot in my personal life. I'm, I've always been close to my family. I've always been close to my friends and that's all totally the same. They're super supportive. Uh, and it's opened a lot of doors and, and, and created a lot of opportunity in, in a very good way for me. So it's really the, the, those, those things have been absolute blessings. So you said this whole sort of empire, vet empire world you're building was part of the vision. So what is like the next phase of your vision? Like where, like what's your secret hopes and dreams? What's next? Like what do you, what do you want? I mean, honestly, I want to keep doing what I'm doing and just get on a bigger and bigger scale. You know, I want to do even more than I can in, in the media space and that platform and just, you know, creating awareness for wildlife and its conservation and promoting quality veterinary medicine and even talking about, you know, how we can best care for our pets too and just getting people excited and educating them, uh, people about animals and just, get, just growing that and making it bigger and bigger and becoming more well known in that space, but in a very positive and constructive way for our pets and wildlife. And how have you dealt with like the pandemic not being able? I mean, I saw on your Instagram you were recently in where were you? Tanzania. Tanzania. Yeah. yeah, amazing. I'm like, I didn't even go to like downtown. But anyway, um, how it, did it affect you to not be able to do your thing and travel everywhere? And was that yeah? Really hard I or? mean, it, this is the first year in several years, and I've traveled 
a lot, you know, not nearly as much. I mean, the last few years, I feel like I think I've been gone probably cumulatively three to four months out of the entire year, probably close to four months and in different, you know, a dozen different countries over the course of a year. And this year, listen, I'm not complaining. I'm super lucky. I've already been to Australia and Tanzania, and that's more than most people can say they get to do in a year. So it's, uh, but, but from, from my perspective and what it usually is, yeah, it's significantly less, you know, I'm, uh, we're still, you know, our hospital has been open the whole time. I work at Conejo Valley Vet Hospital in Thousand Oaks nearby, and I'm still seeing patients, you know, when I can, I'm still, you know, working on other projects. Like we're talking about the book. I mean, the book was, it's taken a lot of my time uh, okay. this year and I've had other projects. I did another Facebook show and other, uh, you know, the Tanzania was actually a technically work related thing, even though I was getting to have fun and get in the bush and, and host this really fun series. But um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely slowed some things down, but I've absolutely managed to stay busy. And uh, I picked up a new hobby this year that I've just absolutely loved and kind of dove into head first and it's woodworking and I've gotten some new power tools and having a super, just a ton of fun doing that and building furniture and stuff. What's your latest creation? I'm working on some mid-century chairs right now. And right. they're, they're called, it's called a Z chair. The Z chair is like the standard common name for it, but it's, it's proven to be a bit of a challenge. This is a very new hobby and it was maybe a little bit ambitious for me, but I, so far so good. We're, we're moving along and I think they're going to turn out okay. Well, if you're selling them, my name does start with a Z. So if you run out of options, you know. There you go. I'll, uh, invest in some Z, Z chairs. chairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, tell me about writing this book. Did you, like, how did you, how did that process work for you? Did you sit down, like, and write it every day? Did you dictate it? Did you work with somebody else on it? Yeah, I mean, so writing uh, and reading were never my strong suits through my education. I'm much more of a math science, right brain or left brain, whatever that would be. Um, and so I, you know, because I'm not a professional author by any means, I did hire a ghostwriter, which I think is common unless you are a professional writer. And so I ended up getting a phenomenal writer. Her name's Jana. And she really found my voice. And we talked a lot. And we had really long interviews. And I had, I had a very good idea of how I wanted the book laid out, the stories I wanted to tell. And then she would just interview me. And she would ask a lot of questions. I would tell a lot of stories. And we had a really good back and forth. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was a lot of the work was just, was just that. And then of course, revising and editing what she would bring to me. And luckily she was, she, I, I, she is so phenomenal at finding someone's voice and, and, you know, sharing their, their verbal stories and putting it on paper in a way that would, would come like, you know, when you read it, that really is how I talk and how I share. And so she did a phenomenal job, uh, but that, that was a big part of it. Of course, working with the publisher, I've been very happy with Henry Holt publications and they're uh, you know they're like a boutique company under Macmillan and they do awesome work they've had some really cool books and um, it's been a dream to work with them too so they've been really helpful along the way and of course I have a team that's very helpful I've got a manager and an agent that I trust and, and so that's it's everything's just kind of been this perfect uh, collaboration cooperation uh, cooperation with everybody it's been great what do you think like the most effective part of your book marketing has been in terms of like what you did or some event that was different or just like anything in this whole, like I'm out and about trying to, you know, tell people more about my book. Like what stands out to you out of all the stuff aside from our amazing interview right now? <laughs> Other than this amazing interview. Um, well, I mean, it's a kind of half answer a previous question about pandemic. This changed everything. I mean, I was going to be going on a national media book tour. I was going to be going to several big cities doing in-person signings and readings and you know, obviously that's not so much the case. So, you know, my team, the publishers and my agents, everybody says social media is the most important, most valuable tool. And so having a decent following, I think is very helpful for that. Um, you know, and it seems to be that way. I'm getting a ton of positive feedback from my followers and I've been sharing a lot of things from the book, whether it's from animal facts or just sharing, you know, what the book's about or just, you know, what, how the project's been going and that kind of thing. I think that's helpful. So, uh, to answer that question, I, I think it's a combination of things, but social media is huge. Doing podcasts really, truly like this one, I think is really, truly valuable too, and just getting it out there. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's one thing. Do you have any advice to aspiring, either aspiring authors or people who want to do something to really make a difference in the animal kingdom and the animal world and conservation and all of that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for someone that really wants to pursue that in a very big way, I think just, you know, you have to be passionate about it and um, you have to show that passion. 
I mean, I think that's what's worked so well for me. And it's not, it's, I'm not working or trying to show my passion. My passion is very vibrant in me. And it just, I'm lucky that I can portray that on a media platform and on social media. And so I think that's a big part of it. And just, you know, I'm so lucky too. I, I get in the trenches. I get in the field. I get to work with these vets on the ground and these conservationists and get to wildlife rescues and, and get my hands on these animals and, and, and show what that's all about. So that, that's a huge part of it too, is the hands-on stuff. I mean, I can sit at home or in my yard and talk about conservation and, you know, people will listen, but if I'm actually out in the field, I'm in the Philippines or I'm in South Africa and I've got a binturong or a rhino or an anaconda or whatever, um, I think that goes a long way. And my last question. So my kids are in the stage where they want every animal under the sun. Right. So my kid, my little guy had a tantrum that we couldn't go buy a blue jay today, you know, after school. Oh, come on, mom. We got to okay. get a blue jay. <laughs> so not fair. I want a bird. I want a bird. And one oh, day it's a hamster and the fish. And, you know, we're in that like mode and we already How have dogs and we're like overrun we have like dead fish floating that i haven't even dealt with oh and, no no we've got like we're like a menagerie here um my little guy is almost six and then i have a seven-year-old and two 13 year olds and they're oh, kind of like over the animals okay. they, i mean wow, they love- that's a whole other challenge and i can't relate to but i do i 100 percent sympathize most of my friends have children and it can be well, tough in terms of the animal sort of pet management piece of life for many parents <laughs> you are like the ultimate animal oh, yeah. whisperer. So what do you say to that? Like, should should us parents like get browbeaten into getting all sorts of different animals to give kids more exposure or just stay with like the traditional, you know, black lab that I have over my shoulder? Like, what do you think about sort of bringing them into your home? Because like this, today we were trying to explain that like, well, no, blue jays are out in the wild, you know, right, they don't right, want to live right. in a cage. So how do you kind of toe that line of, um, you know, wanting to, and, you know, wanting to give your kids a, a love of animals, but not, you know, have your home be taken over. Right. I mean, I think there's, number one, there's a lot of ways to cultivate that without necessarily acquiring new new lives that you have <laughs> to then be responsible for. Okay. I mean, most big cities and areas, you know, other moderate-sized cities, you know, they have really high-quality zoos. You know, zoos are accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and or American Humane, and they're, they're good places where they're doing right by the animals. They're, they are, in a very major way, contributing to wildlife conservation in their you know, respective parts of the world where they have some of the animals as ambassadors of these areas. So that goes a long way. Um, and even just going to petting zoos and things like that, just getting them exposed and getting those interactions is really valuable and really important. And nature is such a big thing, too. I mean, I grew up in Kansas. We had a creek in my backyard, and my parents, you know, they, they both like animals. They're not, like, completely insane like me. But they totally cultivated it and they totally, um, you know, they, they would, if I brought a turtle home for a couple of days, it was, it was okay. And I'd get out in the creek and appreciate the nature. And I'd go catch crawdads and look for insects and look for turtles and snakes and, and the wildlife. Just in, you know, anywhere you live, there's going to be something in your backyard, no matter where you live in the world. Um, so that's always an option too. And then when it comes to the pets, there's no one answer. You know, it really depends on the individual the parent, the family, the children, everything. And so you have to ask yourself, and I say this for any new pet, whether it's an exotic pet or a dog or a cat, is I have three like main general tips. Number one, do your research. Know what you're getting into. What does this pet need? Diet, space, time, ambient humidity, temperature, all these things. You need to be aware of what you're getting into. And you don't provide these things. You're not giving this pet the fair life than it deserves. And it's going to be a disservice to you and the pet. And it's going to be expensive and sad. And it's just not what you want to do. Um, second question you ask yourself is, can I provide these things? Do I have the space? Do I have the budget? Do I have the time? Do I have the ability to provide, uh, all of these things? Am I going to do the upkeep, all that stuff? Um, and then number three, you know, find a veterinarian in your area that's comfortable working with those animals, whether it's a small animal practice, that's very comfortable seeing dogs and cats, or if it's a, you know, if you're looking to get say a cockatiel, which is a great pet bird, they do very well in captivity and can be phenomenal pets. Um, you know, get, find yourself an exotic animal veterinarian that's comfortable. They're going to be a big tool and resource for uh, regular checkups and, and preventative medicine like vaccines and that kind of thing. And it, that depends on the species, obviously, but uh, that's, that's really important too. So if you can ask yourself those questions and say, okay, yes, we do have time for say, we want to get uh, pet rats. Rats make phenomenal pets. They get super strong emotional bonds. It's really like having a dog or a cat in rodent form. Um, super intelligent, great animals. 
Okay, they need to be social. We need two rats. We need decent space for them. We need good enrichment. They're super smart, so we need to you know, constantly do mazes and toys and engage and that kind of thing with them. Um, can we get the right diet? Can we get with a vet? You know, it, just, it really depends on the person. And so for some parents and have the children, especially a six-year-old boy that wants everything, as I did, you know, you just have to pick and choose and, and do what makes the most sense for you. It sounds like you guys have a lot of pets. <laughs> yeah. you know, it sounds like you guys are doing pretty good. And so just putting the energy into the pets that you have is also really important. And so there's, there's ways you can re-excite them about their pets. You know, you do a little bit of research and realize, so I'm sorry, what do you have again, for example? Well, we, so my mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law um, had a dog named Naya, this black lab, and they both just passed away from COVID. And so oh we my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So we, they had two dogs. So we took Naya and then my husband's sister took um, Luna, the other dog, who is like okay. a mix of like three different breeds, but Naya is a black lab. Right. And then I had a Pomeranian um, who's now basically my babysitter's dog. So she brings, <laughs> she brings the Pomeranian in every day, but Anyway, I could like go on and on about this, but this is like not about your book. Um, and then we had these two fish and now my daughter wants a bunny and my son wants a bird. And, you know, we had two fish that we got over the summer that lived quite a while, but, you know, not anymore. Yeah, so. it's the kind of thing you want to educate yourself in. So like fish and some like some of those other pets, they can be lower maintenance in some ways. But at the same time, you need to be very familiar with what a biological filter is and, and know how to properly care for these fish and know what, you know, it's, it takes some experience, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're considering one of the, any of these exotic kind of animals, do your research. I mean, when it comes to bunnies or rats or, you know, the, the we're speed, not getting a rat. No, I'm drawing yeah. the line on even discussing buying a rat. Okay. Just, so okay, yeah. I'll so say, say it, let's say bunny. Okay. Just, bunny. Just, just for uh, hypothetically, you know, you do want to know what you're getting into. They do need space and they do, you do need to have at least two. They're super social animals. So don't just get one bunny. Don't just get one guinea pig and know what you're getting into uh, when it comes to that, to that, to that space. And, and, you know, if you have time that you can do some research, if you're, if you're, your kiddo's really excited about one species, you can ask yourself, you know, don't tell him this yet because if he knows you're thinking about it, it's over. I probably. know. I'm like, at first I was like, oh, I'm going to play him this podcast. And now I'm like, I'm not playing him this podcast. No, no, no. no. <laughs> this, this you do until after the fact that you get the bunny, then you can say <laughs> if you do that. If you don't get a bunny, you can't hear this one. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, know, you just ask yourself those things. But at the same time, like you have four children, you have a dog, you are a busy working woman as well. And so don't be, don't do something that's unfair to the pet. You know what I mean? I mean, there's things you can do with your dog. You can do fun kind of training yeah. and, and things to get him excited about that. So there's other opportunity to cultivate it. And then of course there's great programming available. Like I'm sure he's into Kratz brothers and yes. um, uh -huh. uh, uh, coyote, you know, in, in, in brave wilderness. And there's wild, so many wild cool books in there. Wild Kratz or no, I don't know. Wild Kratz. Yeah. The brothers. And then there's yeah. coyote Peterson. Okay. He's got great kid content, super educational, good guy. I met him on a, a show we did together actually about a year and a half or two ago and super good dude and in a good space and he promotes wildlife in a really good way too. So, you know, there's, there's lots of ways you can cultivate it without necessarily having to get the pets. See, after this conversation, maybe now my almost six-year-old will turn into you. Who knows? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, and that's, you know, cultivating it's so important. I'm lucky that my parents well, let me have pet reptiles and let me, you know, do these things. And, you know, my mom is a landscape designer. And uh, even as a kid, she wasn't doing it professionally, but she was crazy about her landscapes. And she had all these little rock gardens and different things and other, you know, plant gardens too and everything. And I was flipping rocks every single day, looking for roly polies and little millipedes and grubs and cicadas in the right time of year. And I just loved all that, you know. Yeah. Well, it all comes down to letting having your parents you know foster the love of yeah no i'm glad you're saying that message because i cannot stress that enough there's so many people that they their kid they buckle down to their kids getting a pet they don't do the research it's their kid's pet and it's like listen it comes to you guys it's true. okay and then they come to see me at the veterinary hospital and i'm seeing patients and they really don't know what they're doing and our veterinary appointment is not just like a wellness thing because their hamster has a legitimate health issue that's out of their hands it's because they didn't know what they were doing and, you know, because they weren't providing, ambi you know, uh, uh, the proper ambient humidity or UV light or they're feeding an all seed diet to their parrot. You know, I mean, there's so many things that people just don't know and assume and they're either wives' tales or whatever. It's just common knowledge that's totally not right for these pets. And they, they, they find themselves, you know, seeing me because they just 
didn't do that research. So that's, that's the number one thing. Please do your homework, whether it's for your kids or for you, please do your homework before you get a pet and take on a life and, and make sure you're doing it right. Excellent advice. Well, thank you, Evan. Thanks for doing this round two with me and um, sharing all this, all these great tips and, you know, to be determined what pets I end up with next. Um, <laughs> I'll keep yeah, you posted. I hit you up anytime. I'm happy to answer questions <laughs> and make recommendations. There's plenty of other pets besides rats that make great pets. With a bird, a cockatiel, look into that. If, if you're I considering will. a bird, look into that. Okay. Okay. Cockatiel. I'm on it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks so much. Take All right. Care. Take care. Bye-bye.